Hi everyone, welcome back to First Chapter Fridays. I'm really glad you could join me this week because we have an absolutely beautiful book to preview. Uh, it is called Obsessed and it is by Alison Britz and it's actually a memoir, which means it's nonfiction, so it's a true story. Uh, however, some of you are probably thinking, I don't know if I want to read nonfiction, but this is actually what's considered narrative nonfiction, meaning it's a true story but it is written like a novel, meaning it reads like a novel. There's a narrative, you're following a story, and this real person who is writing the book feels like a character that you are relating to in a novel. So for any of you who like realistic fiction, in our library at the junior high, we label that um, genre with a teen sticker. So if you like realistic fiction, you are absolutely going to love this book. It is absolutely uh, beautiful. It is um, a story of overcoming um, great struggles with a mental health issue. And she is so honest. Alison Britz, who's the author, is so honest in writing about her experience and how she was afraid and how she didn't know if she would be able to deal with it and the journey that she went on. Um, so the story is about Allison as a 15 year old girl, which is when um, her mental health issue first appeared. And for her, um, it was OCD, which is obsessive compulsive disorder. So she's a 15 year old girl who seems to be doing great. She's a good student. She has um, a loving family. She's got good friends. Um, and she just seems to be doing really well. And at the beginning of the book, you will notice that that she, even though she's doing well, she does exhibit some signs of um, anxiety. She seems to really stress about things a lot, even though she seems like um, her life is, is almost perfect. Um, she stresses about things a lot. She can't um, let go of things. She replays things over and over in her mind. So I know that anxiety is something that a lot of um, teens and adults struggle with. And that's why I chose this book, because I thought that so many of you might be able to relate to it. And even if you don't have any struggles with anxiety, if you like reading stories about people who are dealing with really difficult things, real challenges, and learning how to overcome those, then you will absolutely love this book. So um, back to Allison. Um, she is a 15-year-old who's showing signs of anxiety, but nobody, including herself, really notices because she does so well in school and she just seems to be like such a normal teenager. And the thing that sort of triggers the beginning of her um, OCD, her obsessive compulsive disorder, is that she um, kind of has a heightened sense of emotion and awareness because of um, her anxiety. And she has a really terrifying nightmare one night. Um, and the nightmare is that she has come down with brain cancer and that she is dying from it. And the nightmare is so vivid and the, the fear and the terror that she feels is so real that when she wakes up and tries to kind of recover from this nightmare, it, start, it starts this kind of snowball effect um, where her anxiety starts to heighten and heighten and it actually manifests as OCD. Um, so that is kind of the beginning of her story. And then the book is basically from that point on, it's basically the story of how this brave 15 year old girl really tries to first um, identify what is going on with her, try to figure out why her life just doesn't seem to be quite the same as it was before this nightmare and what is it that has changed. And then as she starts to understand this thing that she's struggling with, she has to decide if she wants to really try to fight it and try to deal with it the way her therapist is trying to teach her um, or if she's just going to give into it because it's so difficult. So it is this beautiful story about her struggle and the real emotions that she dealt with while trying to go through this really, really difficult um, thing in her life. Um, and the, the re one of the really interesting things about it is that as she's starting to experience these issues with OCD, 
nobody else in her life really notices that anything has changed because she is so good at covering. And I think that's something that a lot of people will relate to, that whether it's a mental health issue like OCD or anxiety, or whether it's some other issue that they're going through in their life, a lot of people, including teenagers like yourselves, learn how to cope really well and they try to cover and people around them don't necessarily notice. And so this is not only her journey through um, learning how to deal with this issue that she has, but also the journey of how her family and her friends um, have to also kind of try to learn to understand this and work um, to uh, kind of learn about what Allison is going through and how best they can help her and support her in this in this journey that she's on. So like I said, if you like realistic fiction, you are going to absolutely love this book. So let me go ahead and show you where you can access it and then I'll preview the first chapter for you. So this website here is um, the link you're going to use to get to the book. Um, so let me just show you how to do that. And this is a different website than I've shown you before. Let me just close this. So hopefully when you click on the link, this is what your screen is going to look like. And this is a website that has several free books through the month of May. So if you're interested in reading this book, you need to make sure you have it done by May 31st because that's when it expires. Um, but you can check out any of the free books here that you see in this um, row. Some of them are only excerpts, which means you only get to read a few chapters, but many of them are full reads. So I'm going to click right here on Obsessed, that particular cover, and it takes you to this screen. And this website is a little bit different than the websites I've used before for your digital books that I'm showing you. So when you click on Read Now, it's going to take you to this screen where you need to register, and it's very simple to do. All you're going to do is put in your email address, and you can use either your school email or if you have a personal email at home, you can use that. And then you're going to check this box, I'm not a robot, and then you're going to click register. And at that point, they will send you a confirmation email. So once you click the register button, go to your email box. And within just a few minutes, you should see their confirmation email. And then all you do is just um, do what the email asks you, which I think is just to click on a link, which confirms that, yes, you want to sign up for this particular website. And then you can go back to the link that I showed you on the previous page and um, click on the book, and then it will allow you to read it. So there's one extra step in, in this week's digital book in that you have to register for the website, but it's pretty easy. So I've already registered, so I'm just going to click log in here. <clears throat> and... Click log in. Okay, so now we are back to um, the screen that shows the list of books. Now you'll notice that Obsessed is not on the screen, so you just need to click right here under Free Reads and you see these first four books. Click right here where it says More Books, and that will take you back to this original screen that I showed you. So again, we're going to click on Obsessed, and then we're going to click Read Now. <coughs> okay. So I'm just going to go back a couple of pages and start with the prologue. The prologue is something, it's a, usually a, a few pages that come before chapter one, and it oftentimes is sort of like a little um, hook or an introduction that's going to lead you into the rest of the book. And in this case, it's um, one of her um, examples of uh, one of the issues with OCD that OCD that she's dealing with. And so this is just a short little um, kind of introduction, and then I'll, I'll read you chapter one. Okay, so this is the prologue for the book called Obsessed, A Memoir of My Life with OCD. Still crouching, I pull my hairdryer out from under the cabinet, untangling its cord as I bring it into the open. I begged my parents for weeks to get it for me for my birthday last year, explaining that I did, in fact, need a $150 hairdryer with four different heat levels and a retractable cord. 
Holding its white plastic, I am suddenly bashed in the back of the head and thrown forward. At the same time, the angry buzz of a swarm of bees fills my ears as the floor starts to shake violently. I brace myself against the toilet. The glass lights around my mirror tinkle. Jewelry, fingernail, polish, toiletries are jostled out of their cabinet and fall loudly to the floor. The earth shifts powerfully, jaggedly underneath me. An earthquake, or worse, my throat is tightening, my tongue swelling. There's a powerful hot presence, a strong hand pressing forcefully against my throat, a gentle taste of blood. I can't breathe. Do not touch that. It is livid, in pure reflex, choking. I throw my arms upward and topple over onto my back. Bad, it screams. Death. I cower from its radiation. I've never heard this voice before, but I know it is my monster, my savior, the source of my secret messages, the inspiration behind my insider discoveries. Anger is vibrating in waves across the bathroom. I'm on the floor, hands in the air, completely still. I should have stopped when I felt the twinge, but how could I have known? A tide of dark clouds closes in over the bathroom and I let out a pathetic whimper as I shield my face. Outrage crackles through the air. It is furious. It won't be ignored. You will not dry your hair, it commands. I nod eagerly in understanding. I won't. I won't. I won't. I won't. I will do anything it asks now that I know its true form. I promise. Okay, so that's the prologue. And clearly you can see that this is not something real that is happening to her. She's having, um, you might call it like a, a dream or a hallucination. Um, and she's struggling with that feeling that something is controlling her. And that's the OCD showing through, the anxiety. All right, so let's get into chapter one. I didn't think the pigs smell me. I think they see me, Ms. Griffin says, reenacting last night's assigned reading from Lord of the Flies. She pretends to apply mud to her face and body like war paint and crouches down ready for the hunt. Overweight in a way that reminds me pleasantly of my grandmother with her frizzy out of control hair flying in all directions. She scuttles in between the desks at the front of the room, a ruler raised high in the air as a spear. And this is her English teacher. In the fourth row, third chair back, I am using Lauren Madison's hair as a shield to stay out of Ms. Griffin's line of vision. I spend most English classes annoyed with Lauren's blonde condition locks, the way they tumble beautifully across my desk and how they smell like expensive shampoo and roses. Today, however, her mane provides a convenient wall to hide behind while I study for my upcoming six-period chemistry test. I am feverishly attempting to memorize the molecular formula of a long list of compounds, most of which I have never heard of outside a chemistry textbook. Head bent forward, pencil streaming across the page, I am writing and rewriting the formula for glucose as I simultaneously whisper it to myself. Allison, what about you? I look up from my mound of notes, mouth agape, C6H12O6, C6H12O6. Allison, hi, yes, join us, please. Put away whatever else it is you're working on. What are your thoughts on the question? Blank stare. I asked what you think about the mounting tension between Roger and Jack. I continue to look at her open-mouthed. My subconscious clanks and grunts, struggling to shift to a new train of thoughts. Lord of the flies, focus. My mind is silent, my stomach tightening more with each second. Ms. Griffin, sweating slightly from her pretend spear hunt, locks eyes with me from behind her podium at the front of the class. I can see that she is enjoying this. I am the girl who other students don't want in their classes. Brimming with anecdotes and opinions, I am the girl who raises her hand when the teacher asks, are there any questions? I am the student to the chorus of groans from my peers who reminds the teacher when she forgot to pick up our homework assignment from the night before. The tense silence continues as I search my brain for anything that's not an atomic symbol. I glance at her, a plea for mercy, but she doesn't flinch. See if I rescue you next time no one is participating in your class discussion, I think moodily. Gradually, my classmates turn around to look at me. They're torn from their bored stupor by the fact that somehow Allison, the girl who was voted most intellectual in the eighth grade yearbook, didn't do the previous night's assigned reading. Well, I think... My eyes dart around the room, looking desperately for assistance. I make eye contact with Greg Sowers, and he just shrugs at me. How did she even see me behind Lauren's hair? I think, okay, Samuelson, hi, it's Thursday, and you know what that means. My hesitant mumbling is interrupted by an announcement crackling through the school's intercom system. 
A peppy female voice echoes against the whitewashed cinder block walls. Thursdays mean JV football, Bulldogs fans, and tonight we are facing none other than Hamilton High School. A low-toned boo lilts through the hallways. Make sure you come out and support your JV boys tonight at 8 p.m. As always, go Bulldogs! With her last syllables, the bell rings and the entire class lurches into action. Saved by the intercom, I quickly gather my disarrayed chemistry notes into my binder and dodge through the crowded classroom, launching myself into the hallway to avoid Ms. Griffin. I make a mental note to myself to catch up on Lord of the Flies tonight. After that performance, Ms. Griffin will likely target me again in the future, if only for her own entertainment. Allison, hey, the familiar soprano voice of my best friend Sarah laughs over the chaotic hallway scene. In my rush to escape, I completely forgot to wait for her outside class like I always do. In the strict social hierarchy of Samuelson, many unspoken guidelines govern the student body. One of the most important, never walk anywhere by yourself. In between classes, on the way to lunch, after school in the parking lot, have enough pride to never be seen alone. Sarah is my best friend, of course, but also a convenient built-in walking partner. Dude, Miss Griffin totally called you out. It's like she has some sort of radar or something. She only calls on me when I forget to do the reading, Sarah complains. It's as if she can see the guilt in our eyes. I let out an exasperated breath before she even finishes her sentence. Sarah has been my closest friend since she sat next to me on the first day of summer camp when we were nine. She is pretty in a way that tells you she's been told it her entire life. Her raucous auburn curls and winged eyeliner are the antithesis to my simple blonde bob and light mascara. Her Rolling Stones t-shirt clashes with my pink cardigan and pearls. Okay, first of all, you never do the reading. And second, I didn't forget to do the homework. I cast her a sidelong glance with a slight head shake for good measure acting more annoyed than I am. I have a chemistry test this afternoon and I was up all night studying, so I didn't have time to do the assignment. It's called prioritizing. I'll catch up on her reading after this test. All night? Get a grip, girl, Sarah exclaims with concern in her eyes and edge of judgment in her voice. Since childhood, she has proclaimed it her mission to get me to take the stick out. Life is too short for this. You haven't been to one JV football game this year. False. Hello, I've been with you twice already. You know cross-country practice goes until 7, and the football game started at 8. An hour isn't enough time to get home, shower, change. It's just not worth it. Yeah, yeah, I know, and you do the long loop on Thursdays. Sarah isn't on the cross-country team, but by now she knows our workout schedule by heart. Exactly. We do the long loop on Thursday, seven miles. I'm so exhausted when I get home. Sweaty, sore. Making it to a football game afterwards is just a lot for one night, not to mention having to do homework after we get back at almost midnight. I'm trying to sound resolute, but it comes out more like a whine. Yeah, well, she pauses and glances around, glancing around to ensure secrecy, half whispers. Let's just say you're not going to get anywhere with Sam with a social schedule like that. We looked at each other and she shrugs. Look, he asked you out for ice cream. Y'all ate some delicious treats together and laughed a bit. Then he texted you two consecutive days in a row. Two. She stares at me intently, her pointer and middle fingers in the air as a visual aid. Now it's been, what, five days, including a weekend since you've heard from him? You have to do something. She's emphatic, energized. If we were standing still, I know she would have stomped her foot. (laughs) He always goes to the Thursday football games. The whole basketball team does. Tonight after practice, drive home, take the fastest shower of your life, and then come over to my house. I'll do your hair and makeup and we'll get his attention. Sarah grabs my hand and beams at me. And suddenly, optimistically, I've changed my mind about the night ahead. I see myself sitting in front of a mirror in a bathroom, almost as familiar as my own, as she straightens my hair and gives me a lesson on bronzer. Look, she leans in and whispers from the side of her mouth. I know you're nervous. I know it's scary. So let me help. We make brief eye contact and she shows a small smile. My heart swells with gratitude for her and her genuine concern for my prom prospects. She doesn't know that I check my phone multiple times a minute, hoping to see Sam appear on the screen. She has no idea that I chewed all my fingernails off last night while playing our ice cream date conversation on a loop in my head. Only I can feel how much his sudden silence is gnawing at my insides, but she can tell just from being beside me, just from being my closest friend, that I need a little help. It seems so recently that we were eating ice cream. After we chose flavors, after he paid, he paid, I looked out the window at the rainy, dreary day and made a comment about how sad and ugly the weather was. He put his arm around me, looked me in the eye, our faces four inches apart, and said, that's okay, you more than make up for it. His breath smelled like juicy fruit. And now he's M-I-A. 
For almost a week, I've been placating myself with tales of broken cell phones or dead grandmas or any number of fluke accidents that might have prevented him from texting me. He is probably starting to grow fearful of just how much he cares about me, I've told myself. Our spark is too intense for his soft, sensitive skin. But as always, Sarah speaks the truth. He's losing interest. It's time to act. Okay, yeah, fine. I'll come to your house as fast as I can after practice. We can just be a little late for the game. I nudge her happily with my shoulder. Gotta go to civics, I say as I pivot 90 degrees to enter the nearby brick building. Have a good day, she throws over her shoulder as we part ways. And make sure you keep all those chemistry notes. I'm going to need to use them next year. Nine hours later, I reach the top of the stairs and let my book bag fall onto the kitchen floor with a heavy thud. Every week we run that same seven mile loop and every week I question why I subject myself to a sport that feels like cruel and unusual punishment because it looks good on my resume, I tell myself, because it keeps me fit, because that's where most of my friends are. It's a relief to be home. I collapse into one of the chairs at my kitchen table. Our sprawling house is dark, lit is dark, lit only by the fading evening sun pushing weakly through the windows. My neighborhood, Blakely Farms, is one of the more affluent in town, and affluent just means wealthy, and I wear our address like a badge of pride, despite my complete lack of involvement in our financial success. There is a swimming pool with a competitive swim team, a pond with an unnecessarily large fountain, playgrounds in every backyard. Chemistry test and cross-country practice behind me, I'm finally feeling the full burden of yesterday's all-nighter. I know I need to put some effort into my social life to see and be seen, but I'm just so exhausted. Well, hey, sweetheart, my mom drawls, walking down the hallway toward me. Her hair is still perfectly quaffed and sprayed from a day at the office, but she has changed into what she calls her comfy clothes and what the rest of the world calls a 10-year-old sweatpants set and fuzzy socks with grips on the bottom. A former army captain... (coughs) excuse me, a former army captain. She has yet to abandon both her regulation haircut and her strict attention to timeliness rules and regulations. As she walks across the kitchen, I almost hear her reciting to herself, left, 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 right, left. My mother is a corporate powerhouse, the family breadwinner. Sarah calls her the Hillary Clinton of human resources. She is the VP of everything and lives up to her, lives up to her reputation with an impressive collection of shoulder padded pantsuits. She smiles at me and runs her hand under my chin as she passes. You look tired. How late were you up last night? Oh, thanks, Mom, I act offended, just adjusting my seat to face her as she moves across the kitchen. I was up all night. All night? Allison, you know that's not good for you. She's standing in front of the pantry choosing tonight's dinner. I don't like it when you do that. You need your rest. Well, I had a test today. What else was I supposed to do? Just fail? Not really an option, mother. I slump over loudly onto the kitchen table for effect, cramming my face deep into my arm. I think about the enormous task that lies in my future, showering. It just seems like so much effort. All to drive to Sarah's and spend way too much time getting ready for a boy who no longer seems to notice me. With hours between me and the conversation with Sarah in the hallway, this football game seems less and less appealing. Are we just going to walk up to the basketball team in the stands like we're part of the gang? Here I am with an hour's worth of makeup and a very padded bra. Ask me to prom. My mom is humming as she pours spaghetti into a pot of boiling water on the stove. From the dark hideout inside my arms, I hear my cell phone vibrate deep within my overpacked book bag. A pang of annoyance because I know it's Sarah badgering me to hurry up. Come on, there won't be any seats left near the basketball team. Or something mature like, you're so slow. I don't move to check my phone just to spite her, but then it buzzes again. Slowly, with individual, methodic, three-inch scoots, I move the chair across the linoleum toward my book bag, while my mother casts annoyed annoyed looks at me from the other side of the kitchen. I dig around, moving aside binders and loose sheets of paper, and dislodge my cell phone from deep within a bottom corner. Sarah has texted. Just heard the boys' basketball team is out of town for tournament, so Sam won't be at JV game. Do you still want to go? Want to come over and watch a movie instead? Don't say you're tired. Me. I'm tired. Need to do homework and catch up on reading. We will do something fun tomorrow night. Promise. XOX. A wave of relief sweeps over me, and I feel immediately guilty for being annoyed with her. She's just trying to help. Within five seconds, there's another buzz. Sarah. Typical Allison. Sleep tight, little bookworm. I look up from my phone with a deep sigh. When did we lose the concept of a school night, I wonder, dragging my loaded book bag behind me down the hallway and up the stairs to my room. Don't take a long shower. I'm starting dinner, my mom yells from the kitchen below. 
I feel a quick blip of regret, regret that I don't have the chance to sweep my potential future prom date off his feet. What if he meets another girl before I can convince him that he is still infatuated with me? What if Sarah gets asked to prom and I don't? After dropping my bag off in the den, I grab my own no less embarrassing version of comfy clothes from my room before heading down the hall to my bathroom. As I let the warm water rinse away the remnants of an arduous afternoon, I almost cry with the overwhelming relief that has swept through me at this last minute change of plans. Of course, in the safety of the hypothetical, I would love the opportunity to woo my way back into Sam's good graces. In my daydreams, I walk toward him in the bleachers, chin high, chest out, and impress him with my wit, charm, and very well-straightened hair. Back in reality, however, I am a hesitant, wobbly colt, a girl who plans out our entire conversation before seeing him and still manages to get stuck on her words. The weirdo who has a list of brainstormed questions memorized and at the ready in case I ever run into him and need to generate a conversation. So how about those Atlanta Braves, right? I can't be witty or cute or flippant, not with him. I can't even mean eye contact for a complete sentence. Of course I want a date to prom. But entertaining a boy at a football game in front of the whole basketball team, the thought makes me nauseous. And just a little interjection here. You notice that you can already see some signs of anxiousness within her. Some of the little things where she's replaying things over and over in her mind. And she's so tired and she doesn't have the energy to to focus on doing some of the things that a lot of her friends would normally do. Okay, let's continue. Loaded with a hearty spaghetti dinner and satiated after a few hours of homework, I settle into bed with my dog-eared copy of Lord of the Flies. I need to get to at least the end of chapter five to catch up with the class. Based on the thickness of the pages between my fingers, it should only take about 30 minutes. I picture Ms. Griffin's smug face at the front of the class this morning. It's like she has no idea that I have six other classes besides hers to deal with, and that intense Les Miserables assignment she had dumped on us a few weeks ago is only more proof of this. Good night, big girl, my dad whispers, popping his head around the corner of my bedroom door. He uses the term big girl endearingly, like you would with a small child who is transitioning from a crib to a real bed. It has been his nickname for me my entire life. The way he says it sounds exactly like love. My dad is part hippie, part former army officer, and I know his biggest fear is that I might grow up to be a Republican. Don't read too late. I won't, dad, just a few chapters. I smile at him in my doorway. Saw your light on late last night. Everything okay? Yeah, just that chemistry test. No big deal. Glad it's over. The words, the last words come out as the beginning of a long sigh. He nods his head and gently taps the wooden door frame. I sure am proud of you. An army brat who grew up in every corner of Texas, he has a rich, deep drawl which leaks through his through against his will, especially when he's trying to be serious. We make eye contact, but I look away quickly. Parent emotions, dislike. I roll my eyes. Yeah, thanks, Dad. I vaguely raise an eyebrow in, in his direction. He pauses there for a few moments, looking at me with a half smile. Good night, sweetie. Good night, I mumble already a few sentences into the book. Ten pages later, I am lying flat, arms sprawled and eyes closed. Through my open window, I barely register the guttural croaks of bullfrogs from the pond at the base of our cul-de-sac, the occasional hum of a passing car, the silence of a Thursday night in the suburbs. All right, so this is the beginning of this nightmare that she's going to have. Slowly, over minutes or hours, the calls of the bullfrogs morph into the gravelly voice of a middle-aged, white-coated doctor. My bed becomes the examining table, my sheets the thin paper hospital gown. The doctor is standing uncomfortably close to me, hand on my knee, gesturing at the dark images and shadows on the computer screen. You have brain cancer, Allison, and I'm afraid there's nothing we can do. He points specifically at a golf ball-shaped blur somewhere above one of my ears. I don't breathe, can't breathe, until my mother's wails shatter the humming silence of the fluorescent lights. Dizzy, nauseous, I slump over, crumbling onto the cold tile floor. When I lift myself up, I'm in the parking lot of my high school. Shapes whirl past. There's a siren, the sound of screeching tires. Stumbling, disoriented, I begin to tell my classmates who surrounded me the fateful news of my sickness, my imminent death. Their screams of sadness erupt with the force of a bomb, and I'm immediately, violently thrown backward. A flash goes off, and I'm vomiting. It flashes again. The pinch of a needle. Swaths of my hair fall in a pile on the floor. Flash. My mother crumpled at my bedside. Flash. A prom dress with an oxygen tank. An IV dripping poison into my veins. I am gasping, crying. Thick black surgical stitches stretching savagely across my bald head. 
My mother and father, a dark room, the ragged breaths. It's okay, sweetheart. You can let go now. I am torn from sleep with a sharp breath in. An autumn breeze filters gently through my window, along with the gray light of the early morning. My body is still sluggish with sleep, but my mind and heart are awake, vibrating, racing with fear. I am crying real ragged sobs of sorrow that shake my entire body. I clutch my quilt and wrap myself around it, latching onto it like a small child to its mother. A cyclone of grief and terror rages within me, and I force my face deeper into the pillows. Terminal brain cancer. The words shatter through me, causing an explosion of emotions. After everything I've done for my future, after how hard I've worked, I'm only 15. I have so much left to do. Prom, college, sex, a real job, marriage. I can't die yet. I haven't even gotten started. With each reason I list for not wanting to die, I'm smacked with a gruesome image from the dream. I'm too young, shaved head. So much left to do, a thick needle IV taped to the inside bend of my arm. I know that I wasn't actually in the hospital or the parking lot, but that girl I saw was me, is me, somehow. I roll over onto my other side, leaving behind a soaked pillowcase. I'm here lying in bed. She's there in a paper exam gown. I'm awake. She lives in my dreams, but we are the same person. I know her. A car horn blares outside. I'm jolted from my thoughts and hurtle into a slumped sitting position. I rub at one of my wet eyes and let my arm fall listlessly back onto the bed. I stare without seeing at the wall, breathing slowly as thoughts filter into my brain. What just happened? My mind is silent in response. I hear my mom's alarm go off down the hall. That means it's 5.45 a.m. Only five minutes before my own alarm would blast me out of bed. She's moving around her room. She turns on lights, opens the windows, warms up the shower. The comfortable muted sounds of her morning routine shock me with bolts of terror and misery. My crying turns to bawling as I remember her falling apart in the doctor's office, the glaring shapes on the doomed MRI glinting off her tear-stained chin. How is she supposed to continue after losing her only child? Imagining her pain and suffering is almost as bad as thinking about my own terrible destiny. No dream has ever felt like this before. I'm choking violently on sobs. My tongue is clumsy and swollen. My mind at once panicked and groggy. Images from the dream pass like a slow motion video reel through my head. My wailing friends in the parking lot, a prom night filled with nausea nausea and needles, a new tombstone carved with 1989 to 2004. Gulping for air, fighting to breathe against a thick layer of mucus and tears, I burrow headfirst into my sheets, allowing my face to slide against the mattress and deep into a cocoon of blankets. Under the weight of multiple layers of cotton, my rapid breath begins to slow, and the small hideout quickly warms. In the darkness, I am forced face to face with my thoughts, with the painful images that filter throughout the background of my mind. What happened last night looked like a dream and dressed like a dream, but from the knots in my stomach, I know that it was much more than that. Something this powerful did not exist without purpose. This was not a dream. This was a message, a warning. I have brain cancer. So this is what her brain, her anxiety is telling her. It really was just a dream, but her anxiety is is trying to um, tell her that it's something more. I lift my head a few inches off the mattress as this thought floats across my consciousness. I watch it move around weightlessly, a jellyfish in an illuminated aquarium. I evaluate it from afar like a newly discovered species. Something about the idea of sharp, ragged edges feels horribly right. An abandoned corner inside me is strangely fulfilled, as if it it had been expecting something exactly this terrible to happen all along. As if it knew this life, this happiness was all just too good to be true. The truth of my brain cancer lies heavily on my inert body. I haven't tried to move, but I doubt that I could. I am frozen in my cocoon, stunned. It's all in my head. I think about it over and over again. My alarm. It's 5.50 a.m. and Nellie and Tim McGraw's current radio hit over and over, knifes itself into my brain. I lurch to sit up, but I'm forced to back down by a taut layer of tangle blankets. I look around the darkness and confusion until I recognize the sound of the noise and gradually relax back into the comfort of my bed, mindlessly following along with the radio. It's one of those songs you can't, you just can't escape. In the grocery store, in the car, in line at the pharmacy, I know every word because it's all in my head. I think about it over and over again. I take two or three breaths before the thought clicks into place. I feel it snap together like two Legos. My heart thuds as I slowly repeat the song's chorus. It's all in my head. 
It knows about my cancer. The radio knows about my dream. It's warning me about the illness all in my head. I dig my fingertips into my sheets. Overnight, I was sent a premonition masquerading as a dream, and now I'm being blasted awake by a song that is clearly referencing the dark shadow in my brain. Clever, very clever. This alarm is another barely veiled message from who that there is something terribly, horribly wrong with me. Smoothly as if I had practiced with this sort of maneuver, I slide myself out of the sheet, smack the top of my radio hard with my palm, and slide back through the small entry into my cave. In one fluid motion, my face is again covered in cotton, surrounded by a calm darkness in less than three seconds, but the blast of outside air has shaken me a bit. As I get comfortable again, there's a slightly different hue to my thoughts. I've never felt such strong emotions in a dream, or for that matter, in my entire life. It seemed so real. And then there was the message from the radio. But wriggling for a fresh air pocket in my cocoon, fighting against the cloud of warm breath that is gathered for my collective exhales, I think that maybe it was just a coincidence. Maybe I had a terrible, terrifying nightmare, and then just so happened to wake up to a song by two wildly popular music artists. It's a major radio hit after all. It's on all the time. So you can see this is an example of her mind trying to tell herself what the reality is, but her emotions are are kind of overwhelming it. But that song, my brain screams in protest into the silence. With that chorus, what are the chances that it would be playing at the very moment my alarm is set to go off on the very morning I wake up from what I might go so far as to call a borderline paranormal experience? How much clearer do the messages need to be? Good morning, honey. Time to get up, my mother coos as she pads down the hall toward my room. My entire body goes rigid. I can't let her see me. I'm sure my eyes are swollen, my face all red and blotchy. She will know immediately that I've been crying and swoop in close with a million questions. I stay buried deep under the blankets. There's a change in the air when she enters the room. It's almost six o'clock, sweetie. Up, up, up. She tickles the bottom of my feet. Mom, I moan. I'm awake. My voice cracks unintentionally. Oh, honey, you sound stuffed up. I'll make sure to put some allergy medicine out for you downstairs. Are you feeling okay? Do you need a tissue? She pauses briefly, wiggling my calf through the thick comforter. With my extended silence, her tone changes. You need to get up or you're going to be late. I'm not leaving this room until I see your smiling face out from under these covers. She claps a few times. Now, up. I continue to lie still, face down in the sheets, damp with my own tears. Allison Marie, it's time to get up now. Five, four, three. There's nothing more infuriating than when my mother starts a countdown. It makes me feel like I'm six years old and getting bullied into cleaning up a mess of toys. Mom, okay. I mean to groan at her, but it comes out more like a snarling growl. Go away, please. A few seconds pass in awkward silence. I don't need your step-by-step assistance, thank you. I can feel her presence as she stands quietly above me for a few moments. I rarely talk to her like this, and I know she is debating whether to make this into a parenting moment. After about 10 seconds, and with what I imagine to be a shake of her head, she walks away down the hall. Okay, so that is all of chapter one. I hope you are interested in this book. I hope you are interested in this real person, Allison, who is starting the beginning of her journey with anxiety and OCD. Um, Remember, if you are interested in reading the rest of the book, you just need to go to this link that I showed you, go through that one-step registration process, and then you can um, select the book and read it. And just remember, it needs to be done by the end of May, by May 31st. Okay, thank you for joining me this week, and I really hope you guys take advantage of this free book, and I'll see you next week for our next First Chapter Friday. Thank you.